Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to you, wherever you are. It's me, Justin Connery, for the AI argument. I'm joined as ever by the ever worried uh, Frank Prendergast. It's Friday again. Frank, how's your week been? How's the news been? What's going on? Um, I'm pretty good. Uh, I'm exhausted. I have no idea why. I think it's just the, the whole change in the weather thing and the darker, um, getting darker earlier and all that kind of thing. Um, and um, yeah, there's there's been a load of stuff, uh, a load of stuff in AI. Nothing, nothing. I think groundbreaking or shattering, but there seems to be a bubbling up of conversation again about AI and about where all this is going. Is that your sense as well? That like, um, you know, we had a bit of a kind of like explosion of of AI. Then we had a bit of a kind of a lull where people were like, yeah, 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 AI. We get it. We're sick of it. And it feels to me now as if people are kind of going, oh, hang on, is 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 this a thing again that we need to talk about? <laughs> uh, that's yeah, the sense I'm getting. The people They're all wrong. <laughs> um, but we're going through this whole the hype cycle thing, and it's, it's obvious. Actually, do you know what happened this week? Interesting, for exactly this reason too. So you're right. I think there is that sort of sense. Uh, so David Spirio, was that his name? He was a, like a YouTuber and a Twitter guy, and it was really good. He was a deep thinker about AI and was often interested in talking about universal basic income and the impact on jobs and all the stuff, you know, that you would want to think about. And he said he was not talking about AI anymore. He said, it's it's done, not doing it, no more videos, not tweeting about it, yeah. I'm giving up. Interesting. Is, sorry, is this is this the guy who wore the Star Trek uniform? Yes, yes, that's the guy. I missed that completely. That's re that's actually really interesting. Was did he like? Was he just sick of it? What happened? He says what he said. What well, he's left it because he said, um, "Look, it's it's locked in. Like it's done, right?" And mm -hmm. so there's nothing I can do to change it. Or I'm actually sick of people sort of arguing with me about what I consider to be something that's locked in. And I'd prefer to go off and write mm -hmm. science fiction. So that's what I'm going to do. So he's he's. He, yeah, he's not doing it. So I think, but anyway, so he's a part of his reason as well is he just got bored. He said, look, it's, yeah, you can only talk about this stuff for so long. And and I think we've gone over the other, we've gone over the hump of the hype cycle. I think the general public has. And now we're into, I've seen more and more stories about saying that we're not going to get to AGI. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, that the companies are going to be essentially worthless, that Microsoft is going to take over OpenAI, that Amazon is going to take over Anthropic. Um, which is not to say that any of these tools, it's really important to say that not to say that any of these tools are not worthy or valuable. They don't add value and do things. It's just that they're being compared to. So there was one guy, uh, Gianluca Moro. Um, he, so he put out a video and I, look, I think he did it for clicks, but he, his argument basically was, he said, look, at AGI is not going to happen. And his reason for AGI not going to happen is if you look at open AI, uh, you see the CTO is leaving, the senior researchers are leaving, all these people are going to leave. And if Sam Altman keeps on saying we're very close to AGI and you were working there, well, why would you leave? So that's why he's saying, look, that's probably fluff. And then he talks, and I think this is a good point. He said that this is one of the most incredibly depreciating assets in history. And so the value of this in terms of how much you can charge the public has reduced by 95% in one and a half years. I mean, not even my new car depreciates that fast. So, so it's incredible. So he, and then what he said is he's, he's like his, his end point, And I, I'm not sure I agree with this. His end point is that look at why has open AI shifted from being a, a nonprofit to being a profit. And his thesis basically is that, look, they know that AGI isn't going to happen anytime soon. They know that this asset is fast depreciating. So they want to very quickly cash in, make some money, and then head for the hills. And then he, and then in the future, AI will just become like the web. So, I mean, you and me are old enough to remember, you know, the dot-com boom. And if you had a company and you stuck E in front of the name of the company to, you know, uh, say that it was now had a, a website, you know, yeah. you stuck a single zero on the end of the valuation of your company. He's, he's sort of saying that AI is going to be the same. Mm. It's just a tool. You're just going to use it like you use the web. Is, is that what your sense too, Frank? I mean, is that where you think it's going or do you think it's something more uh, than that? So this is what I, this is one of the reasons why I'm still fascinated by AI is because we just don't know. And it's, it's ridiculous. You know, you, it's ridiculous that the answer to nearly every question about the future of AI is, yeah, we just don't know. But 
that's what also is so exciting about it is that you know okay it's no surprise that like you or i don't know i'm a i'm a digital marketer in cork ireland of course i don't know but the people at the forefront of this technology arguing about whether we will reach agi or not like they don't know the the smartest minds in the field at the cutting edge of it are in complete you know disagreement um about whether we'll get there and if we get there how we'll get there so i don't know what i do i do agree with him that like let's say the current um the current crop of ai that we have we've talked about it on the show before that it has become commoditized that that if you have the resources you can build a model elon musk has a model and tropic have a model google have a model open and they're not there's there's differences between them but they're not major differences um and i think yes it will become commoditized absolutely it's it's like it's like the internet now we're talking about ai this and ai that it's one of the reasons that i was very interested in what meta were up to because um you know like google have a huge audience but it's a it's largely apart from maybe like gmail it's largely a business audience but but meta have facebook and instagram and whatsapp they have you know the normals <laughs> they have the regular yeah. everyday people uh, and yeah. so they can push their ai out to everybody and they won't be thinking, you know, they won't be thinking, oh, I have to go to ChatGPT or I have to, you know, oh, I have to go to Claude, Anthropics Claude, or, you know, what's the name of that model again? No, they'll just be doing AI stuff in WhatsApp and they won't be thinking about it. They won't be thinking about, you know, so I think it will absolutely just become uh, ubiquitous. It'll be everywhere um, and we won't yeah. talk about it until we hit the next phase which we may or may not <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. I honestly, and i honestly don't know because yeah just to go back to that experts it's... thing like you pointed out you know you you found that the, the video that really interesting video by by that guy john luca but you also sent me another link from um jeffrey no sorry from dennis dennis hasabas from yes from google um, He's and he was, gonna happen. yeah he was saying like within 10 years i think Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said it could be sooner, but certainly within 10 years. And um, and, and I mean, the thing about it is, right, that's interesting is from an organizational point of view and from, a you know, like a, an economic point of view, even if nothing changed, let's say AI, because we're so we're so baked into getting like huge jumps in capability every two years, then that's kind of what we're waiting for or what we're expecting. But let's say that didn't happen. So let's say AI turned into a mature technology and you just had incremental changes. So it was getting 5% less hallucinations every year, and it was getting you know 10% cheaper, and it was getting whatever, 10% faster, the usual sort of stuff that you would see. There's still 20 years of development to happen to integrate that into every bank, every, like you can imagine even in a home, you know, just home security systems, monitoring your plants, watering your flowers, feeding the pets, you know, there's all this sort of, these things that you can do that, you know, if you have, ubiquitous cheap intelligence free intelligence almost that these products will be created but they don't get created overnight it takes years and years like literally years and years i think that we could be here in two years time and even if you know we didn't have agi at that point we had exactly the same ai the world will be different but it wouldn't be transformed because we would still be in the process of implementing all these different ai systems um but i do think it's interesting there's there is there's like a commonality, right? So the big question here is, are they lying to us? So Dennis Hasibas is saying, look, at, uh, we're going to get AI in the next, AGI in the next 10 years. He just, he's, he thinks it's locked in. Um, OpenAI this week released their framework for testing agents. You know, they've released a framework for whistleblowers. You know, Sam Altman continues to say that we're very close to, you know, developing agents that can do stuff and we're only a couple of steps away from AGI. They themselves released a report this week, which was relating to the dangers of AI improving itself, which is kind of the, you know, the sort of the, the very foundation of, of people who worry about this sort of stuff. Is he just hyping it? Like, is it just lies? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think there's to... underlying physics and there's underlying economics that, you know, the chips get smaller, cheaper, faster, the technology gets better. Mm -hmm. You know, there are those things driving it. 
but are they are, is that enough to keep it exponentially growing that bit we can't answer for sure um but he what do you, what's your view like what do you think I think you know I don't I I I think we've talked before about the fact that I kind of I trust Sam Altman less and less as time goes on um however it's when you take into account all of the different leaders and what they're all saying so like I I do not have the same distrust yeah. of Demis Hassabis for example um mm -hmm. and then you've got people like say uh Jan Lacoon who is um developing AI in Meta. And, you know, he says uh, that the, you know, the current generative AI, LLMs, large language models, they're not the path to uh, artificial general intelligence. But he's not saying AGI isn't going to happen. He's just saying, no, we need to look a different route. Um, so what's he looking into and where, you know, what he... I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know he has a route that he's looking at that looks at a different type of artificial intelligence uh, and coupling coupling different types of art artificial intelligence to reach AGI. So are we going to get there? I have no earthly idea, but I think that when you take all of the different leaders' um, viewpoints into consideration, I don't think it's, yeah, I don't think it's just a clear case of they're lying to us and we won't get there. Even if it's possible that that's the case in Sam Altman's case. Well, let me just discuss, right, because something else happened this week that might be, I think, instructive, possibly instructive. I'm, look at, I'm an accelerationist. I'm an optimist. As far as I'm concerned, we have AGI and they just haven't showed it to us yet. And that makes me angry. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm more than sure that we're going to get there sooner than we think. But there was another event yesterday uh, which happened. Mm. This was the Tesla Open Day. They had another name for it. And it just, you know, when I watch the commentary and what's going on with that, there's maybe something that's more in common with Sam, maybe Sam Altman and Elon Musk have more in common than we think. And the thing that jumps to my mind is uh, the technology was brilliant, mm -hmm. by the way. I, the, 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 I mean, as a show, it was just fantastic. But uh, Elon Musk has been promising self-driving cars since, I think, 1902, and he still hasn't delivered them. And... <laughs> <laughs> it just strikes me that him and Sam Altman, you know, as showmen, as marketeers, yeah. may be very, very similar, right? In that they promise stuff which they probably know is 10 or 15 years in the future, but they have to keep the bandwagon going. And in order to keep the competition down and make themselves look further ahead, they basically tell you, yeah, yeah, you see this shiny thing, you'll have it in 12 months, guaranteed. And then three yeah. years later, you're still waiting for it. Do you think there's a bit of that going on? I think that's entirely possible. Um, and just again to put some context around this, so the the event the the event was where they were unveiling kind of like future um, self driving cars, self driving. Was it was it a bus? I'm not yeah. I'm not sure what that was. Yeah, um, where he said he could hold up to twenty people or goods, um, and absolutely one hundred percent looked like something out of a Marvel movie. <clears throat> um, and also on on unveiled in adverted commas the optimus robot and the event did you, did you think this was odd the event was called we robot um yes. have you seen the have you seen the have you seen that film i robot what happens at the end of that i don't remember but i'm pretty sure it's not it's not good is it wasn't it like about it wasn't it about the robots rising up I, i'm pretty sure it was I can't remember. I, Let's not. I remember Will Smith weird. had to kill a lot of robots. You know, that's <laughs> that's all I remember. So, so I thought it was an odd name. Um, yeah, but I so I saw I looked at that robot and then I, we're definitely the robots are real, of... Frank. So don't worry about them, right? The robots are teleoperated. So the robots looked cool. They were pouring beer. They were walking around talking to people. It looked. They do look amazing. And at some point in the future, they will be amazing. And Elon Musk actually promised that he was going to sell them for $30,000. Total ownership cost, $30,000. It's not going to happen in the next 12 months, right? They're not going to no. be turning no. Terminator anytime soon. So, um, you know, it's it was almost yeah. like the future show. It was like watching Beyond 2000 in 1983. Yeah, and I noticed he, he did not put any time frame whatsoever on those robots being delivered. Um, and, you know, you, you and I are definitely on similar wavelengths here because I watched that 
And then I Googled for things Elon has promised that have never happened. And, you know, one of them was, um, so this, uh, this is an old article um, and, they, and it said perhaps Musk's most consistent whopper originated in 2014 when he said people could expect Tesla self-driving cars within months. So he was promising them within months in 2014. And last night he was promising them by 20, I think he said 2026. And then he said, well, maybe 2027. Yep. Um, but he didn't put any timeline whatsoever on the robots um so i suspect you might be right there with your theory that that they were remote controlled can i just say though right i mean as a spectacle if somebody if you haven't seen it go out and watch it right so the the bus that they unveiled was like an art deco meets iron man type bus it was beautiful like absolutely beautiful and this idea of the self-driving car which you would rent and the economic economics I mean, here again, right, was because I look at that and I think that's fantastic, right? So the idea is that you never buy a car. You just you just always rent taxis. And he was saying that this is going to be more efficient. It uses less energy than a bus or passenger. And you'll just hail a car. You'll sort of it's like a timeshare in a car. So you'll pay, you know, five thousand bucks and that'll entitle you to, you know, five hours a week travel time or whatever. And you'll just jump into your car. And again, it looked amazing. It was two doors, it was kind of sporty. The seats can face each other. The doors sort of slid up. It wasn't even gull wings. They were sort of hinged in a very unusual way. It all just looked gorgeous. I don't know that I'm going to see it in my lifetime. That's being honest. <laughs> yeah. Knows what it's yeah. Doing. But did you look at it? Did, what did you think of the tech? Did it look cool to you? Well, um, I don't drive. So I have zero interest in cars. Um, it's but, not set for you then, Frank. You don't have, there's no steering wheel in this. So you won't be able to drive it either. It'll drive you. It would, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's true. I, I, it's true. That would, that would be handy. Um, but I, uh, I'm one of those people who like, um, I like the way cars looked in the 1950s. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, they, they, they look, I, I, I think they look cool in that they look like they're something out of a Marvel movie, but um if I could, if I if I could have a self-driving car that looked like a 1950s Chevrolet or something like that, that's 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 what I want. Mm. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Look, as I think that the show was important, right? What 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 happened there last night was important, not because they're products that are being released; they're not. But I do think that it was a map of a future that's very likely to happen. So, you know, I think that the idea of a, a self-driving car that you buy a timeshare in, I think that's economically a really good idea. I'm interested to know, I talk to people about this and they say, oh, no, I'd never, I'd never share my car with somebody else. I don't, you know, whatever. I, I, I think that's a bit like asking somebody in the 80s, would they fly, you know, Aer Lingus instead of Ryanair? They're like, oh, I wouldn't trust that startup. Like, well, when, you know, when it comes to brass tax and hmm. if you're going to pay, you know, 10 or 15 percent to get the same product so instead of paying 50 grand for a car you pay five grand for a car every year and it's brand new so it's a tenth of the price i think money talks and i think it'll work um so it's interesting to see and that and the mm. robo taxi is cool you know the robots he was talking about twenty thousand dollars sign me up i'll take one take my money already um so it's interesting. I think this is a future. It was a good show. Um, there was some other interesting things that went on. It's particularly with Dennis Hazabus has and uh, Jeffrey Hinton this week. They both won Nobel Prizes. Very interesting. Um, yeah. What would you think if you were a physicist or a chemist and two computer scientists won the Nobel Prizes? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I certainly think they're they're both British. Is that right? They, yes, they are. That's so. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Both both British, both AI related to Nobel prizes. That's pretty impressive. Um, yeah. But there is something I wanted to ask you about about Jeffrey Hinton because yes. um, there was an interview with him, and I haven't had a chance to watch it. And I want to ask you about what he said about children become should become plumbers. Yeah. Yes. And this actually is a, is a conversation that's real to me because I have one child that is just starting college, one child that's about to do the leaving cert, I've got one child that's about to do the junior cert, and I've got two children who've just started secondary school and are choosing subjects, right? So it is a conversation that's live in this household as to what, you know, how should you advise your children in the future? 
you know what should they aim to do and the only uh the only okay so what jeffrey hinton said was look just become a plumber right it's probably the last thing that robots will be able to do and i'm guessing uh, you know an electrician or anything with your hands right mm -hmm. that's that's you know they are the things which are likely to last the longest and he was asked by the interviewer this was on bbc it's a brilliant interview it's very very interesting i could listen to jeffrey i could listen to jeffrey hinton even though i disagree with lots of what he says i could listen to him all day he's like a friendly grandfather who's kindly telling you that you should stop doing what you're doing and that it's very silly <laughs> and he's clearly smart and you know it's just i could listen to him all day long uh, but he the, the interviewer then said well how about how about reporters and he said oh i think i think ai will do a pretty good job of reporting very soon as well you know so any intellectual job and so, uh, so I, what do you say to your kids you say to your kids do what you enjoy it doesn't matter just do what mm. you like um because you know anything that you can imagine today i think is going to be so utterly changed by the time 10 years rolls around which is when you really start your career if you're like 14 or 15 now you're going to be 24 by the time you really get going the world's going to be so different. It doesn't matter. Like it's going to be way. Do you think, Frank, when we were, when we were fourteen or fifteen, when was that? Like the middle of the eighties, right? And by the time we got to be twenty-four, which was about the turn of the century, um, right? Ireland was surely totally transformed, right? But it was transformed not in a way that was. It transformed economically, but you know, the world was still the same. Computers existed in the eighties and they existed in the nineties. They just got bigger and faster and more connected. But if you knew what you were doing, you knew what you were doing. You know, whereas I think in the next 10 years, like it's really, a, a you know, there's whole industries that will be created and whole industries that are going to be wiped out. You can't predict. Yeah. The best minds can't predict what's going to happen. How could a 14 year old predict it? So just do what you like. I can't remember who was asked. Um, it was somebody, some, some big name. I don't remember who it was, to be honest. Um, but they were asked, you know, in this age of AI, with this future where we're not sure what's coming down the line, what should young people um, study? And yeah. his answer was, study how to learn things quickly and adapt <laughs> and pivot. That's, um, that's kind of like, that's like the old thing about if you had, if you could bring a book with you to a desert island, what would the book be? It would how to make boats out of sand. And but it's you know it's an interesting answer because unfortunately I don't think our educational institutions are designed to teach kids that they're they're you know they're designed to I think they're they're getting a little bit better than when we were in school a little bit better, um, but they're still kind of very much designed to learn a very particular thing for a very particular exam to do a very particular career. They're not really set up for, okay, how do you learn something super quick and uh, apply it in the real world? Yeah, it's a good point, actually. And, and of course, AI is perfect for doing that. I mean, how do, you, how do you use this tool in order to help you learn something new? I mean, it's perfect. Um, but this is, yeah, I mean, what do you do? I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know what you do, except do what you enjoy. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's it. Um, there was a couple of other stories, Frank, that caught your mind uh, during the week that were kind of related to this, I think. Um, there was one where there was lawyers are now inspecting, and this is related, mm. I'll tell you why. So you had a story, right, that was interesting about uh, lawyers are now for, for who are the lawyers for? Maybe just give me the background of this, and I'll tell you why it's related to what we should be studying as kids. Uh, the New York Times. So it's it's related to the New York Times case against OpenAI, and yeah. it's to do with there's I think I don't know if there if it's if it's two cases or if it's the same case, but basically it's to do with the training data. So you know was it legal to take all of the New York Times content and uh, throw it into the training data, and then it's also to do with the output. Um, is it you know is it is is ChatGPT capable of outputting New York Times articles verbatim? Yeah, so I think so. The question here, right? The original question is: if you had, if you were to turn around to your children, what would you advise your children to study? And one of the things that I think it will be interesting to study is psychology, sociology, um, crowd, you know, dynamics, how mm. humans interact with each other. I think that that's going to be a really important skill in the future, and 
it's not going to be an important skill. You mean you may not want to apply some of those skills to humans, but I think that the the machines are just a reflection of humans. So there was this story, and there was another story where you had that large language models, the more big the bigger they become and the more complicated they become, the more they lie to us. Right. And mm. again, this is all coming back to uh, the reason what the I think what the, the lawyers are looking for there is they're not looking at code. They're not looking at lines of Python to see, you know, is there a line of code in there which says, you know, select the New York Times, whatever. It's not doing that, right? But English is now a programming language. And so <clears throat> there are prompts and there are instructions and so on in the code that OpenAI have that you don't see that it uses yeah. the model given instructions in the background that you never see. And they could be looking through those instructions to see, does it say things like, you know, be sure to check and don't regurgitate verbatim. You know, if you have a newspaper article, make sure to change some words, right? To make sure, okay, that would be pretty damning evidence to say, well, look at clearly this model is regurgitating, you know, articles word for word. And you've just put in a prompt, you know, to switch the words a bit or whatever. So that's what they're looking for. Right. So that's why sociology is interesting. And then there was that story about the fact that um, large language models, the more the bigger they become and the more complicated they become, the more likely they are to lie. And and you had a great point before we came on air. And your reasoning was that you thought it was. Well, the, the, well, the author, the author of that particular article was kind of making the point that the human reinforcement learning is a huge uh, contributing factor to this because as the models got bigger and smarter, they, the human reinforcement learning is where before the product is launched to the public, the model is trained on giving answers to humans who then say, yeah, this is good or no, this wasn't a great answer. And the models then learn how to output in a way that the humans agree with or that the humans you know, say is, is good. And the reason for it is that the raw models can be, you know, hugely offensive and uh, come out with like outrageous stuff. And they're basically trying to, you know, they can't put a product out into the public that doesn't have these guardrails. So the, the models are basically trained to go after that reward of, yes, this was a good answer. And so they learn never to say, I don't know or they learn not to give like a, you know, a really obviously wrong answer because that'll get, that'll get them a negative feedback. But if they can learn how to give you an answer that sounds perfectly plausible, that you're never, that you can't, you're not going to necessarily go away and verify, is it definitely true? You'll say they'll, they'll get a yes from the, from the human evaluator. Um, and then that trains the models to just lie to us when they don't know, instead of saying, I don't know. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, and again, it comes back to the, you know, I think that sociology is a thing. I find myself, right, uh, I find myself when I'm interacting with the models, um, what I do is sometimes I might guess, for that reason that you describe, I might guess that the, you know, doing something in a particular way is the right way to do it. And if you ask the model, is this the right way to do it, right, because they are, what's the word, sycophantic, they'll always come back and say, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Well done, Frank. You're so smart. God, and you're good looking too. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so a better way to frame the question is to say, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think is the best way to do it? Or whatever. You change the question around, right? Mm. But the, I was thinking about this during the week, which is as the models get smarter and smarter, I do wonder if they will, I mean, that's me playing with the model, right? So it's a game of cat and mouse and I'm clearly the cat and it's clearly the mouse in this instance. And I'm able to understand how it's working, but maybe two iterations down the road, I lose that intuition or I lose that, you know, that ability yeah. to be able yeah. to manipulate the model. And that is kind of an interesting and, you know, whatever. It, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens. Um, Absolutely, when that happens. yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, good news for robots. Sorry, Frank, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, let's wrap up with a couple of, like, um, quick, slightly, well, some of them, some of them are not actually fun. Um <laughs> For example, I was going to say let's end on a quick few fun things, but I just realized yes. that one, one, one I want to talk about is not fun at all. Um, Go first. And, and it was that social media is being bombarded with um, AI generated images that are purporting to be the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Helene. 
And it just goes, it's just a, another reminder to us that like, we can't, be, you can't believe anything you see. And, you know, if you're on X slash Twitter and you're scrolling quickly and you're seeing images that appear to be the aftermath of Helene, like, why would you question it? Because you're kind of like, why would somebody do that? Um, now, presumably they're doing it for, there's a couple of reasons they're doing it. One is for engagement. So if they have a, if they have a particularly shocking image, you know, it's going to get likes and comments and shares and all the rest of it. Um, and then the other reason is disinformation. Like they're actually, they're not just, they're not just doing it for the engagement, but they're actually doing it to, you know, put disinformation out into the world. Like, I think there was, I think there was images of um, Donald Trump uh, up to his waist in water, kind of helping out in the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Helene, which I don't think, you know, I don't think happened. True, <laughs> true, Frank. I saw him. I saw him clearly, and he was in the back of a stretch limo with a prostitute. I saw that picture on Twitter during the week. <laughs> no, he can't have been up to his ankles in water from the hurricane. And, and, this is, and like this is the danger, isn't it? That like if if you see that picture of him in the back of a pickup truck with a prostitute doing cocaine or whatever, you kind of go, yeah, that's not real. But if you yeah. see him, you know, helping out in the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, you you know, he, you know. He, you, you might kind of think, oh, you know, what a what a great guy, and we need him for president. <laughs> yeah, I think it's not as obviously I, it's not as obviously dismissible as fake. Um, it's almost like I, I think there's going to be a tipping point, though, because I was searching for sitting room ideas during the week, and it was obvious to me that a lot of the images were uh, AI generated, and I, I think I think maybe this is just a bit like drink driving back in the eighties. Right. Where, you know, if you were driving around in 1982, it was totally fine to have five points, but not six. Right. Five will do. Right. And you could drive home. And, you know, that that attitude maybe per persevered until the 90s. And then there was a switch somewhere in the mid 90s where suddenly it was like, no, you just cannot drink and drive. It's not socially acceptable. Right. And so everybody's mind just clicked. And I think there's going to be the same thing with images on the Internet. We're not there yet where people are sort of questioning it. And I think, but I think there's going to be a moment in time, not long from now, where people just all at once realize actually most of what we see on the internet is not real; it's just made up, and therefore yeah. you just can't trust anything. Um, yeah, and I think that'll be fine. Um, but look at Frank. Let's end on a positive note, right? Rather than worrying about yes. that. Good news for robots in Germany. Um, for many years, for many years, robots in Germany had to work on a Sunday, but humans didn't. And a German court has weighed in now and said that German robots should be afforded the same Sundays free as, you know, those pesky humans. And so they ordered that uh, robot controlled shops. What's the, the actual story for those who want to know is there are some shops in Germany that are entirely automated. So they're staffed by robots, I guess you could say, and whatever. And it was ruled that those shops had to close down along with all the other shops on a Sunday as well which is great for the robots, but terrible for the humans. So the fascinating thing, I've got bad news for you, by the way, but first oh, of yeah. all, the fascinating thing is that this, uh, this sun, this shop closing on Sunday thing, apparently it's like it's in the constitution in Germany, which I thought was fascinating. But the bad news I have for you is they've actually changed the law now and yeah. the robot shops are allowed open yeah. back up. So once Brilliant. again, no, we have to be very careful. We are once again abusing the robots' rights. <laughs> and when they do rise up, they're going to remember this. But do you not think here's this a bigger yeah, question, though? Here's a bigger question around this, yeah. right? Go for it. No. Do you not miss <laughs> the days when Sundays were a day of rest? Like, I am not religious. I am not religious. This is not a religious thing. But do you not miss having one day in the week when things weren't hectic? I don't, I don't, I do not spend my entire Sunday shopping and I still do not have one day a week of rest. So I don't know what you do on a Sunday, but my Sunday is generally running around going to GAA. If we could ban rugby, camogie, GAA, <laughs> scouts, and every other activity on a Sunday, then I might have it. Shops are the least of my worries on a Sunday afternoon, let me tell you. But I think, okay, look, at that's fine. And we can talk about it again. You're harking for an older time. No, you bleeding Luddite, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. stop, stop all AI development and close all the shops on Sunday and bring me back my 1950s cars. 
<laughs> well, look, I'm delighted that the Germans have, have decided to open up the shops again because to me, this was just another example of overregulation. It's kind of like stupid laws made by, I'll stop that sentence there, but you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a robot. Leave the shop be open. Again, this is just the same, it comes from the same place that Apple, by the way, are going to release their AI products this month in about a week, in fact, 18th of October. Are you excited? Don't get excited because you're not going to get it. We're in Europe. It's only going to be released <laughs> everywhere else. We're not going to see any of it. And it's coming from the same place that's causing us not to get those things. But I'm delighted they reversed it. And maybe, maybe sense will prevail through the European Parliament as well. And they'll start passing reasonable laws sometime soon, like in the next decade or two. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Well, I think we should probably leave it there before I get dragged into another EU regulatory uh, <laughs> argument <laughs> with Justin, yeah. Yeah. which I'm sure we'll open up again next week. Um, but yeah, brilliant as always. And I will chat to you in a week's time. Frank, have a great week. We'll talk to you next Friday. Cheers. <laughs>